energy. It is the inherent capacity to create, direct, initiate, influence, and do something to bring about what we want. Power is innate to all beings in existence. It is something that all of us have. And it is wonderful in and of itself. It's about how that power is used. Because power can be used to damage and to harm. It can also be used for good. In life, we will all find ourselves in certain situations where we feel incapable of creating, directing, influencing, or doing anything so as to bring about what we want. We feel out of control, disempowered, and at the mercy of others. At times like this, it is infuriating to hear people say, you've given away too much of your power. It's an invalidation to the reality of the powerlessness inherent in the situations where many of the elements involved are beyond your control. It also doesn't make automatic sense to most people. Why? Because you weren't aware of consciously giving anything away to anyone. <laughs> this is why it's important to understand that gaining your power back is really just about realizing that you have it. So without much further ado, I'm just going to jump into it. How to realize and actualize your own personal power. 1. You have got to get that free will is an absolute of your existence. It is impossible for someone to take it away. People may be able to take away choices, but they cannot take away choice itself. In essence, all somebody can do is to put intense amounts of pressure on your free will in the hopes that if they do that, that you're going to use your free will to choose to comply. They can't take it away. Also, you couldn't get rid of your free will even if you wanted to. Now, you may use words like, they made me, but that's not the case. In these types of circumstances, they were able to put enough pressure on your free will that you used your free will to choose to comply. What this means is that in every single situation you find yourself in in life, you have got to question where you think the power lies. Some of you know and some of you don't know that I was tortured in my earlier life. This life. Let's say childhood and teen years. I don't mean metaphorical torture. I mean actual, literal, physical, emotional, sexual, and mental torture. So this is coming from the mouth of somebody who knows exactly what it means for someone to put enough pressure on you that you will choose because of that amount of pain to comply. This is coming from somebody who knows that what they will use is your greatest Achilles heel, your greatest source of weakness as leverage in order to make you choose. We have the tendency of telling ourselves that someone made us do something, but they didn't. In order for you to grasp this concept completely, I'm going to get really extreme with you in the hopes that any situation that falls short of this is going to make a lot more sense and you're going to be able to access a lot more personal power out of that. If you look over the course of history, there are so many figures, people, who have been put in the situation where they are forced to choose to comply or choose death. And they chose death. That's still a choice. It's still a choice they were able to make. Let's talk about torture, shall we? Myself included. There were many people who were put in situations of captivity and physical torture and pain who found out that even though somebody took choices away relative to somebody's physical body, they did not take choices relative to the mind away. So you can still choose what you do with your thoughts. The point is they still had choice. Because of this, they cannot control you. Compared to these extreme situations, you should be able to see your free will inherent in any other situation that involves somebody putting any less pressure than that on you to choose what they want you to choose. Something most people don't know is that death in and of itself is a choice. Upon coming into this life, you now are two points of perspective. Your temporal self and non-temporal self actually both have free will. In order for true death to occur, both have to actually agree. They have to find alignment in death. So often, this is what comas are actually about. You may very well find yourself in situations where somebody uses their power to put so much pressure on your free will that you will use your free will to choose to comply, and no one can even fault you for it. Anyone might choose that in your particular circumstance. You have every right to feel that it is incredibly unfair and super fucked that they're using their power in that way against you. However, never confuse that with losing your free will. It's just putting pressure on it. Two, get into reality and accept what needs to be accepted as fast as humanly possible. 
Your only access for personal power is within reality. When we are using our free will to resist what is, we have no power. It is wasted energy. We are always at the effect of others and are fighting the situation we're in instead of making immediate adjustments in response to it. For example, let's say that somebody refuses to see and accept that an economy is collapsing. Obviously, the choices they make are not going to be particularly empowered choices, are they? Those are not going to be choices that lead them to making the right decisions given the situation at hand. Also, so you can understand this particular point even deeper, I want you to imagine you're playing a chess game. Spending time not getting into reality, refusing to accept something, is absolutely as pointless as sitting here playing a chess game and when somebody makes a move, spending your time denying the fact that they've made that move, refusing to accept the fact that they've made that move. That's the way to lose a chess game. Once they make that move, you get in reality about what chess move they just made, so you can plan your counter move. What this means is you have got to surrender to the truth at hand. Surrendering to the situation itself is very different than surrendering to the truth of the situation itself. The second you are able to surrender to the truth, you are able to make those decisions about thoughts and emotions and actions that will put you back in a space of power relative to creating what you want in the situation that you're in. To understand more about this, you can watch my video titled How to Call Bullshit on Denial and my video titled Reality. Three, when we feel powerless, we become hyper-focused on what we can't do. It's almost like the universe around us starts slamming doors and windows in our face. And we sit there banging on a door and banging on a window, hoping that whoever closed that window or door will somehow have mercy on us and open it up again. It's wasted energy. Because it's dependent upon somehow the other person on the other side deciding it's in their best interest to open them again. Again, it's displacement of your own personal power. It is far more empowering to look for whatever windows and doors might be open. Alternative doors and windows. You might be able to own your power by trying to convince them it's in their best interest to open those doors and windows. This is the power of influence and persuasion at work. But I need you to get, it may just benefit you much more to put your energy towards looking for other doors and windows. Long story short, if you want to own your power, <laughs> You've got to think about what you can do, not about what you can't do. How can you influence, direct, initiate, do something to bring about what you want? Four, be true to you. This is such a critical point to get. For this, you're going to have to be super freaking brutally honest with you. No one can control where you put your energy. I mean no one. Now, energy is focus, energy is actions. Where you direct those things can't actually be dictated by someone outside you. All they can do is put enough pressure on you that you choose to put your energy towards something that they've decided serves them. Let's talk about commitment for a minute. To commit to something fully is to put all of your energy into that thing. So how do you have personal empowerment? You put all of your energy into what's true to you. Put it into what matters to you. Put it into what's meaningful to you. Put it into what's important to you. Another way of saying this is that your power is really about staying as true as you possibly can to your values and what's important and meaningful to you specifically. This requires powerful authenticity. To understand more about authenticity, watch my video titled How to Be Authentic. Five, realize that this is a fractal-based universe. Now, if you really grasp what I just said, that is your key to all the personal empowerment you could possibly want in your lifetime. Everything that is outside you in this universe is replicated inside you in this universe. What does this mean? It means that if you feel powerless to something on the outside, you've got a little bit of an interpersonal relationship issue going on on the inside, don't you? That can be remedied. Every conflict that exists externally is also a conflict that exists inside you, and everything has a consciousness that you can access. If you turn your attention toward feeling, seeing, hearing, and knowing these parts inside you, and towards resolving those internal conflicts, you will no longer feel powerless. If you feel powerless relative to serial killers, find and integrate the serial killer in you, and the part of you that's a match to being killed by one. If you feel powerless to viruses, find and integrate the part of you that is a virus and the part of you that's a match to being destroyed by a virus. 
If you feel powerless to narcissists, find and integrate the narcissist within you and find and integrate the part of you that is in resistance to the narcissist within you. This time-space reality you currently call home is a mirror construct. What that means is, is that the external reflection changes the second that whatever's being reflected, which is you, changes. It will blow your mind how fast this reflection externally changes when you remedy your relationships inside you. It will also blow your mind when you do this work of recognizing that thing that you're nervous about in the external, on the inside, and working with it how much empowerment you feel with dealing with that situation in the external. It will change the entire way you approach these things that you didn't approach well before. If you want more information on this, watch my videos titled Fragmentation, the Worldwide Disease, and Parts Work, What is Parts Work and How to Do It. If you perceive yourself to have no power relative to something in the external, on the outside world, find it within you and integrate it. Six, put yourself back in your hands. In order to understand this, I want you to imagine that you're in a deep swimming pool and there are other people in the swimming pool with you, people who you perceive to have more power and therefore see as much larger than you. Because you doubt yourself, because you lack the confidence, what you do is you swim to each one of them and with each one, you try to climb on top of them so they can be responsible for you not drowning. In that moment, they, hold you in their hands. It's up to them whether you sink or swim, isn't it? You are their responsibility, so you get to blame them and make it their fault if you drown. This absolves you of pressure, that's for damn sure. But it also absolves you of your power. See where you are doing this in your life. See where you're expecting them to be responsible for you and therefore putting yourself in their hands and simply hoping they do the right thing with you. For example, you might be doing this if you expect your abundance to come through a paycheck from your boss instead of seeing your own skills as your venue for achieving abundance. You might be doing this if you expect your doctor to heal you instead of taking responsibility for your own health. You might be doing this if you expect other people to make decisions that affect your life. You might be doing this if you make your partner responsible for changing in order to be whatever makes you feel good and powerlessly sinking into unhappiness in the relationship you are in instead of actively taking steps to change the dynamic or choosing another partner. So I want you to ask yourself some questions. How can things related to your well-being be in your hands instead? Where do you think the power lies in this situation? How can you switch the situation so that the power lies with you? People who intensely embrace responsibility are the ones that have the most power. Next point, words have incredible power. Choose those words that empower you instead of those that disempower you. For example, change I can't to I won't or I choose not to. Often when we say I can't, what's happening is that we're recognizing a limit that doesn't actually inherently exist. Or we're failing to recognize and powerfully own a limit and do something about it. Meaning, if that's a limit, how do you accomplish what you want in another way? Change he made me into he put so much pressure on me that I chose to. Your words shape the way you think about yourself and the world around you on a deeply subconscious level. This includes language where you're blaming or making excuses. When you're not owning your power, you will have a plethora of excuses for why the thing you want has not come to pass, for why it's not happening, for why you can't bring about what you're wanting. Pay close attention to the language you are using to convey why you made certain decisions or choices or why something is or isn't happening the way that you want it to be happening. You might be surprised to notice just how often you're making excuses. And I don't want you to forget Absolving yourself of responsibility absolves you of power as well. Seven, recognize, feel, and build your confidence. So much about feeling personal power or taking your power back is about feeling confident. And you're not in that circumstance right now. If you lack the power, what it is is you're recognizing where you have no confidence in the situation at hand. So I want you to flip this. Ask yourself the reverse. What, relative to this particular situation I find myself in, do I feel confidence about? How could you increase your confidence in that situation? 
What could you learn in order to increase your confidence relative to the situation at hand? I also want you to make a list of what you do feel confident in that has nothing to do with this particular scenario. We have the tendency of focusing on where our lack is because we are a growth-focused type of species. We always focus on where the deficiency is, not where the, let's call it, abundance is. So one of the steps you can take to fill your personal power is to recognize where you actually have confidence in life. If you recognize where you have confidence in life, the areas where you don't won't feel like they diminish you so much. For example, you may feel totally confident with cooking or being able to work with someone's emotions or fixing a car or painting or understanding complex concepts or cleaning and organizing. Resource the confidence that you currently take for granted in those things. Also, never forget, there was a point in time where none of us felt confident with walking. But now we feel so incredibly confident with walking that none of us would even think to put it on this list. Eight, get out of the position of victim. I'm not going to gaslight you. People are raped. People are murdered. People get taken advantage of every single day. These are things that fit into the category of being victimized. Do victims exist? Hell yeah! But they also don't exist. We're all just the victims of victims. Why do I say this? People don't hurt someone unless they're hurt themselves. All right, so here's the reality. You were the one who was hurt in the situation. You wanna know the rub of it? It doesn't change anything. This will be one of the hardest pills you ever swallow if you were truly victimized. I can tell you this myself. The fact that you were victimized won't change a thing. And it sure as shit doesn't mean that the other person who caused you that pain will ever take responsibility. Human beings make a big mistake. They like to look at fault or blame and assume that responsibility goes hand in hand with it. It doesn't. There is no relationship between responsibility and fault. Fault and responsibility don't go together in a world where every being has power. And taking responsibility is not an admission of guilt. It is not letting someone who hurt you off the hook. It is nothing more than a recognition of personal power. It's an act of emotional self-preservation and empowerment. In other words, it isn't a man's fault that he had an abusive alcoholic father. But even if it is his father's fault, this doesn't mean his father will ever take responsibility for picking up the pieces and righting his wrongs and fixing the son he abused. This means if he wants a life that feels good, the ball is only in his court to pick up the pieces of himself, to find a new fulfilling relationship and heal. It doesn't matter if something in your life is someone else's fault, you can't guarantee they will ever take responsibility for fixing it. This means the power and therefore responsibility is in your hands even if it isn't your fault to change the situation into what you want it to be instead. So I want you to look at responsibility in this way. Imagine that the word was response and ability. Essentially, that works itself into the ability to respond. Do you always have the ability to respond? Yes is the answer to that question. So in what ways can you respond so as to bring about what you want? What happened to you happened. It can't unhappen. So the only question left is what you're going to do with it now. There is so much shame going on in the world today about being in victim mentality that it's very hard now for people who are genuinely victimized to actually process through the feelings that come along with being victimized by someone to being wronged or being hurt by them. It's almost like it's not even right to think about it that way. That is not what I am here to say to you today. In fact, it is critical if you have been in this victim role to actually process through all of the feelings associated with being in the role of the victim, to take loving care of the part of yourself who feels as if it's been wronged, that feels as if it's completely powerless to somebody else. You have to do that in order to heal. That means you have to admit to it in order to heal. So I would love it if we could all get rid of this shaming that we keep doing to victims. But this is what I'm going to say to you. Once you have processed through those emotions, what are you going to do with the situation now? The reason that you would want to stay in that role of the victim is because it serves you somehow. Again, there's no shame in this. I mean, none at all. What it is is that you are really desperate to convince somebody that you're innocent and good so that they decide to take mercy on you. And by taking mercy on you, they decide to do things with their energy to bring you to what is good for you. 
So again, it's a displacement of power. If they see me as innocent and they see me as good, they will take responsibility for doing something that gets me to what I want. That's what victim mentality is about. Being in the victim role is an attempt to put yourself in other people's hands. So face the very hard question. What positive thing do I get or am I trying to get out of complaining to people or telling them how badly I was hurt by someone? All there is is a decision to make about whether you want to maintain that position or whether a different approach serves you better. How might you have power in the matter instead? Nine, wherever possible, you need to make sure that you're in the position of cause instead of effect. We live in a universe that is based off of a law of cause and effect. Now, we don't really think about it being within our power to be on one side or other side of the equation. But we actually have some. Here's what I mean by that. You live in a universe where everything other people do is going to affect you. Everything you do is going to affect others. However, these are two different positions. Now, all too often, we let ourselves stay in the position of being at the effect of others. To give you an example of what I mean, this is something that entrepreneurs have figured out, and quickly. <laughs> if you're in the position of being able to be fired by someone, then you are at the effect of them. So an entrepreneur has essentially decided to put themselves in the position of causation. I'm the one who creates all the mess-ups in my world. A person in a relationship who simply blames their partner for the negative pattern that is occurring within the relationship is at the effect of their partner. How do they switch into the cause position? By recognizing their role within that pattern, how they themselves feed into it. Once they recognize anything that's theirs in the situation and change anything that they can based off of that awareness in the situation, they have switched into the position of causation. So anytime you're in a situation where you feel as if you are at the effect of someone else, I want you to ask yourself this question. How could I adapt to the reality of this situation so as to switch back into the position of cause instead of effect? 10. Follow the North Star of your desires. This fits in nicely with the previous point that I made about being true to you. Desire is freaking everything. Remember the definition of power? It's about being able to bring about what you want. Desire is inherent within power. Commit your energy to your desires, values, and what is meaningful and what is important to you. Follow these things like a compass pointing you due north. As I've said earlier, to fully commit to something is to put all of your energy into something. This means mental, emotional, and physical focus and actions. Your personal power is about being able to bring about what you want. This means commitment to what you want, what is meaningful, important, and what you value is central to personal power. Doing this, following the North Star of your desires, makes you a driver of your life instead of a passenger. But I do have to warn you, doing this means you have to be willing to go in a different direction than other people are going. Doing this might mean, if you're a total rebel, going in the same direction everyone else might be going. <laughs> it's gonna be just as hard for you if you're a rebellious type of person. Doing this means the willingness to stand out from the crowd. Doing this means continuing to point north no matter how much pressure someone puts on you. And that includes making you wrong for what you want. There are plenty of situations in life where it is perfectly in alignment for you to take your power and get in the back seat and let somebody else's power get in the front seat in a given situation. I'll be talking more about those types of situations when it comes to teachings on relationship. There are lots of situations where it's not even about power being in the front seat or the back seat. However, for the sake of this episode, which is all about you owning your personal power, you've got to get that it is within your power to choose whether to give somebody that front seat or not. That means it's a choice. That means you have power. Have a good week.